Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie Boozer. I'm with CUGC HQ and I am happy to welcome you to today's CUGC Connect webinar with Bitdefender and Citrix. We're talking about um, security and workspaces and what your top five concerns should be and probably more importantly, what you should do about them and how to address them. So before we get into that content, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today. Um, he is a CTA, his name uh, Donald Wong. He is uh, going to be keeping an eye on questions for us. And um, with that in mind, I'd like you to type your questions into the question box. He's gonna watch those. Um, we might get to them during the presentation, but most likely we're gonna save them up for the end. So be patient and bear with us. Um, Donald, would you like to come on and say hello really quickly? Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar today, and hopefully everybody has some pressing quick questions for our panelists. Thanks, Donald. All right, so let's get on to our presenters. We have with us today Eric Beers with Citrix. He's the lead security architect, and Sean Donaldson, who is the director of strategic alliances at Bitdefender. And I know that we have a lot of content to get into today, so I am not gonna hold them up any longer. I'm gonna let them get started. So take it away, guys. Great, hi everybody. Uh, so let's start by talking about taking a look at the evolution of the threat landscape. That's a good place to start. You know, starting with simple single dimension attacks from script kitties causing mischief, it evolved into organized crime over time. Um, nation states and terrorists started getting involved. And the motives are really changed from mischief into financial gain. So it gained a lot of traction because of that. Um, we, we started seeing new and disruptive technologies like smartphones, the evolution of social media, increasing the overall scope of threat delivery. Like technologies like cloud and IoT has vastly increased the surface area of the attack, which only further increases um, you know, as we move the edge uh, of the computing landscape. And the attacks, they also got more sophisticated over time. Like we started off with viruses and worms, which were more of a nuisance than anything. You know, they got more advanced, they got more persistent with spyware and rootkits, and extremely persistent with APT, uh, advanced persistent threats, and cyberware becoming basically commodity. Like you can just go online today and just buy these, these tools. And DDoS has been around for a long time, but the multiplication factors and the number of weak devices on the internet has caused it to really hit new insane throughput. Like we've seen recent attacks of above 1.7 terabits of throughput, and you know what's next, right? You know we're starting to see AI in some of these hacks, and we're also seeing a lot of hardware hacking. So we really there's a lot of stuff uh, still to be attacking us in the near future. So the response initially was very simple, like antivirus on endpoints, adding a perimeter firewall, doing some IDS and IPS, and maybe some host-based firewalls eventually. But now we're getting into really neat technologies uh, like sandboxing with advanced threat protection, hypervisor introspection. It's all new and exciting and can be automated to help sort of through the end user behavior analytics, machine learning and AI, we can really sort of start gaining some control back. The attacks will evolve, but so much the defenses. And we, if we stop evolving our security, we're gonna lose this, this essential arms race that we have going. And to take a quick, brief history of enterprise security, we started off in computer security with disconnected computers. The threat potential from external attackers was minimal. Like we look back at science when war dialing and sneaker nets was a thing, worried about modems and rogue floppy disks around our network. You know, it was, it was a simple time um, that, that we lived in. So then we started connecting these computers together on a LAN, and although the threat potential increased, it was still quite controlled. You know, number, very minimal number of ways to get into the system, and the attacks were, were, were still fairly simple. Then we decided to connect our, our computer enterprise, or enterprise computers to the internet. You know, we had wired computers connected, so placing them behind a firewall and an IDS, and installed AV on those computers, you know, the threat potential became high due to the amount of connectivity. But in recent years, we've added mobile devices, we've added wireless networks, cloud-based services, additional communications between business partners. And what have we done to really rethink security in this new world of highly connected and uncontrolled devices? You know, the perimeter has expanded, it's changed. We, we have a mix of consumer and enterprise devices. We have shadow IT to contend with, no matter how much we try to ignore it. Um, does IT really have a great handle on the applications and data? 
you know, the times are changing. And, and there's a lot of bad actors out there. Um, security is no longer the responsibility of just IT. Um, everyone really needs to be involved in this security conversation and really be, comes back to all, all it takes is a single click from an end user to trigger some ransomware or, you know, the new attacks of crypto jacking uh, to really get infected badly. So with these incre increased threats, you know, with that changing perimeter, additional third party access and how to lock those apps down, you know, and, and, and I'm starting to think about, should we trust any user, even if the user is a trusted user, maybe they're on a platform that, that shouldn't be trusted. And with the increased adoption of cloud and SaaS and mobile devices, you know, this is going to impact our di di overall digital transformation. So the ability to swiftly revector the business security posture will be critical. We used to think about our perimeter defenses as castles and moats. Uh, it, it's no longer about just the castles and moats. No matter how deep you dig that moat and build those walls at the edge of your perimeter, the castle is not effective against, say, a modern day drone attack. Um, from what we see, some businesses are still hiring stonemasons, but these businesses are, are in the process of failing through dig, uh, their digital transformation efforts. You know, we love this concept of defense in depth, and we also love the concept of layered security. They're great principles to use. But we have to rethink and realize where the boundary of the perimeter is in today's environment. You know, it's not just at the edge of our networks anymore. You know, today's enterprise users, they want to work from anywhere, common experience on any device. Uh, they want unified, simple access everywhere, wherever they sit, if they're on-prem or in the cloud. They want to be productive without being encumbered by the security restrictions. And because those perimeter defenses have changed, we must think in a new perspective of the user and the user's personal perimeter. You know, business needs to talk and, and seek out new security frameworks to deliver that once competing priorities of experience and security. And I think it's overall time to rethink that security rulebook and playbook. So we often start with this non-consolidated access strategy, one where the apps and data are not under full IT control. Many applications and data reside on endpoints and in the clouds. Um, and it's not all known by IT due to the shadow IT component. We really want to think about consolidation, but we also want to think about how we can move more of the apps and data under the IT control. So a key benefit of Citrix Technologies is moving the control of the apps and data and services back under the control of IT. We want to think about identity and access. We want to gain the controls to ensure appropriate levels of access based off the user, the endpoint, the network, and the security profile. We want to think about network security. We want to make sure we have encrypted delivery of applications and desktops to employees. We want to think about application security. We want to think about centralizing the application and operating system patch management and various configuration management. We also want to ensure you know, secure file sharing uh, by preventing the actual data from residing on untrusted or unsecured endpoints. And we also want to think about the overall monitoring and response. We want to, you know, have true insight as to what's happening so that we can quickly respond as needed. The NetScaler as an entry point into the applications and data allows us to integrate identity, authentication, and controls in the right place to make the right contextual decision. This allows us to have a safe place for termination of both TCP and TLS, and an extending an untrusted network with a full VPN into a trusted area opens us up they're just too large of an attack surface. You know, Zen App and Zen Desktop allow us to control the context and the location of where the applications are, and it gives us a great place to actually apply policies and controls. Many designs have applications in different areas, so although I'm really showing just a simple single site, this of course can be extended to the cloud and to of course other data centers while not actually impacting the user experience. So I wanna talk just briefly about uh, the Citrix Secure Digital Workspace. So, <clears throat> sorry, uh, as the users are being distributed in many ways on SaaS and on-prem, multiple data centers, we need a framework to protect the user's apps and data in a very, a little bit more of an intelligent way. On the left-hand side, we wanna provide a unified experience, allowing simple connectivity to, a, to have sophisticated controls in place. We wanna leverage contextual access and performance, tailoring the session to the minimum that, the, the, that is required by the user, while not overwhelming IT with a lot of manual uh, policy control. On the right-hand side of this diagram, we want to enable IT operations and management, with providing unified endpoint management and content and application controls while providing still a rapid response. And overarching all of this, we really want to be able to enable IT to have a deep understanding of the security and, and the performance analytics. 
So the big pro uh, challenges we're trying to solve, you know, really revolve around application and data security, you know, rapid recovery after an infection, preventing browser-based attacks, because browser and email are like the, the big attack vectors these days for ransomware and crypto jacking. We want to think about secure file sharing, and we also want to think about uh, intellectual property containment. So we started doing a lot more security-driven designs rather than compatibility-based designs uh, of yesteryear. You know, ZenApp and Zen Desktop, they can be used for access segmentation. And in one of my, in my experience, at least, one of the very few methods that can be used to secure legacy applications. In this diagram, we show that we have multiple ZenApp silos um, that are actually in different security contexts. This segmentation allows us to control the application and data flow in and out of the security context that have different trust levels, access levels, while all still providing that single interface uh, through user aggregation. Another key concept of Citrix is the pixel air gap firewall through our ICA or HDX protocols. You know, using HDX policies and restrictions on application publishing, we can provide very secure access environments. Um, you know, this is a way that we can display an application without giving up the control of the application binaries or the data. We can reduce the attack service dramatically by eliminating the untrusted computer to actually run that um, application locally from within a trusted zone. This is, of course, nothing more than TCP stream delivering to the receiver on the endpoint an interactive session, right? We're screen scraping and sending the visuals down to the user. And this delivery really leaves no residue on the endpoint device of what data was actually transferred. And that's really key to, to some of my next uh, presentations. So one of the first um, security designs that we started doing a long time ago, of course, was PCI. You know, we started introducing this term called secure enclave, which was first helped to use really to protect your credit cards and personally identifiable information uh, for PCI. It was well over a decade old. This is not a new concept by any means. You know, and this diagram on the, on the screen here comes from our Citrix PCI white paper, but it shows the providing control where the application runs and where the credit card numbers actually remain um, within a trusted area rather than being on the endpoint. And a key concept of this is really to reduce the size of the PCI audit. We try to reduce the scope of which, what needs to be audited. If we, we could make the entire enterprise PCI compliant, but that usually requires way too much expense. So we're trying to minimize the, the overall attack surface. Also, this design tends to also come in another flavor, which is sort of the double hop or at least the secure enclave within the data center. Um, so it can uh, still provide remote access to this, but we're not going to generally use the standard NetScaler at the edge of the network uh, to be the edge of our higher security environment. Another secure enclave design, which has sort of come to light lately, is for SWIFT. So SWIFT provides the money transfer network for banking institutions. So the SWIFT customer security program was introduced in 2016, and customers of the SWIFT network had deadlines for self-attestation and meeting some defined criteria. As part of that overall program, um, it sort of had three buckets, and there's sort of eight core concepts within here that I wanted to just briefly talk through. You know, if you want to think about securing your environment, you want to, you know, in this case, they're, they're recommending jump servers, which we're going to use Zen app or Zen desktop to achieve that. Uh, and we're trying to segregate the general enterprise IT, and we're also trying to know and limit our access, as well as detect and respond properly. Within the SWIFT uh, documentation around the CSP, they do mention using a Citrix type solution, which is great uh, if they referenced us, so um, definitely had a lot of uh, traction because of that. You know, and here's the diagram from our SWIFT white paper, which basically shows uh, at a very high level the concept that you have a secure zone within your server environment that's separate from your general IT services. So we want to protect access to this uh, more secured environment. So generally what we're going to do is we're going to use NetScaler at the edge and use something like smart access for not only contextual access, but additional authentication uh, and so forth. You know, contextual access really provides dynamic policies applied at the time of resource use. So instead of micromanaging policies that fall at a date, we customize the experience and access based off our general rules of connectivity. Next up, wait for the slide. All right, next slide is going to say restrict internet access. I might have lost control. Sean, if you could just forward it for me. Um, so a classic question is, should admin have unrestricted internet access. And 
I think the answer should be no, right? Administrators should not be running a browser under administrative credentials and then go to the internet. It's just way too big of a vector. And the, good, the secondary question is, should users have unrestricted internet access? And I think the answer should be no. Um, using a technology to sanitize your outbound traffic is important. Sanitizing proxies have been the de facto standard for a while, but now with the introduction of deeper analysis and analytics being possible, as well as security subscription services where they can dynamically update based on insights from a much larger set of computers outside your organization, we really sort of get ahead of the curve. This also brings up the idea that we've seen customers deploying browsers in secure enclaves at different security levels. Why should you log on as admin and use that browser uh, as an admin credentialed browser? And we're starting to see people actually deploy multiple browsers in separate secure enclaves so that we have a social media browser, a high security browser, and a low security browser um, that are all disposable, but you know, still provide the user to save their favorites. But you know, um, if that browser becomes infected, it doesn't spread uh, too far. Great, I got control again. So next thing is protecting critical systems from general IT. Um, there's a lot of customers that have very flat networks, and IT is just one network, and the way we manage it is is very flat, right? So in the definition of the Swift CSP, the definition is vague, but the idea is sound, right? We have legacy IT components that have may not have all been rigorously audited for security. So why should those systems that have not met the highest level of trust be mixed with, you know, our newer trusted environments that we're building? So we also want to think about reducing our attack surface by blocking everything except port 443 at the edge. This is an isolated, secure bubble. First, by providing end-to-end -end encryption, by not only exposing TLS port 443 outside the secure zone, but also inside of that environment as well. Like we also want to think about removing unnecessary services from systems, locking down network, host-based firewalls are a great example. Um, we also leverage a lot of application layering to make sure all the components are up to date within the layered images, and also ensuring a quick patch time uh, to actually patch these new environments. Uh, this section, we don't really do this at Citrix, physically secure the environment. We really got to leave something to, to other vendors. So although we do help a lot with Swift, we do not necessarily provide locks and mechanisms like that. Um, preventing compromise of credentials is really a, a couple parts to this story, but through the NetScaler, we have multi-factor authentication. We have n-factor, and we also have federation capabilities. So we're seeing in a lot of our deployments now where the user that they log in, they're actually logging in with one credential and then they get impersonated and they're actually logging into a resource that's actually not that same credential. Um, you know, it still allows IT and security to, to, to map those two together, but you know, um, restricting the actual credentials that the user actually even sees is actually a very nice trick. We also want to think about managing identities and segregating privileges, and we want to think a little bit further about segregating our privileges and have, you know, we all have an admin account and a standard user account, but maybe there should be a third account as well. Uh, or maybe we should only provide one account, and then based off of the login, we build the system such that it actually restricts the identity or separates the privileges out. To detect anomalous activity, uh, and transaction records, there's, there's a lot of things we can do. Um, we're starting to see a lot more usage of session recording uh, in use in production um, to, to basically record what the users are doing. Uh, we're doing a lot with Citrix Analytics today. It's amazing technology that's really gonna continue to develop very quickly, but really being able to pull out anomalous activity from large amounts of transactions really is something we can't do at scale uh, by humans. Um, and we will be talking later on uh, in this presentation about HVI and antivirus to help with block and detect some of this malicious uh, activity. And then of course, planning for incident response and information sharing, right? So this is a big thing where single image management, non-persistent images are great for recovery, as is technologies like ShareFile, honestly, that, that allow for recovery of ransomware through versioning. Although I'll say, although we've never done ShareFile to, to solve a Swift requirement, it still meets that specific uh, capability requirement. So we also have the neat ability to disconnect the whole environment for research and incident response. You know, a traditional deployment of, of, of applications on local endpoints, there's no way to have a kill switch um, to basically stop all activities going forward. So by actually having the control to separate, uh, it gives us a really nice uh, point in time. Yeah. 
Wait for the next slide. Oh, I didn't realize there was an animation in that one. I think that's what messed me up. Uh, so by deploying physically separate ZenApp sites um, or silos, you can isolate more sensitive data from more common data and there's no bleed between them as well as decreasing the overall risk of unauthorized party accessing the data. You know, the, the term ZenApp silo used to be a bad phrase, used to be a bad word because the amount of work it used to actually uh, entail. So today we have automation, right? We have single image management, we have application layering to reduce the overall operational burden. So we're starting to see the increase of number of ZenApp silos um, being built uh, specifically to separate out security uh, locations. I would also like to say that this diagram and most of the discussion is, of course, single site. It just can be deployed in multi data centers, multi clouds, while still providing that aggregation to a single interface for the user. Another great example of this honestly, recently has been teaching in research hospitals that have a lot of personally identifiable information, high valued research, yet at the same time have a lower security postured student that has access to the system. So we're starting to see at least those kind of scenarios where you know, it makes sense to have a separate silo for them because um, we really don't want to bleed the data or the applications or the operating systems uh, between those different parties. So bringing it all together, here you can see the final form, right? At least considering just the on-prem. You know, access is provided with multi-factor authentication, possibly le leveraging federation or impersonation. Uh, endpoint is evaluated for suitability to connect through endpoint analysis. TCP sessions are nicely terminated in the DMZ, not allowing users' computers to directly access the network to components that are higher sensitivity. And data and applications are run uh, and constrained from the location that makes sense to most. So overall, there's a variety of workspace security challenges. Um, you know, a big one out there is end user security education. I don't think anybody can ignore uh, training their users because that seems to be the weakest point a lot of times. Um, you know, but that's really comes back to sometimes where there's a written policy, but there's no technical policy to actually enforce what the user can or can't do. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of authentication and identity, a lot of movement to the cloud, we're really starting to rethink identity and, and, and federation as well. We want to think about security monitoring and integration of those components, which we'll talk about in a few slides. Um, also think about a secure onboarding process of applications for users as well as application, or applications and users. And really the scenario here is a lot of times we throw an application on our environment without really testing it for security. Uh, without really know, you know, downloading it from a secure site. No, we don't usually validate the, the checksum of the download to validate that it wasn't tampered with on the fly. We also want to apply sufficient controls without impacting user experience. We have this overall challenge of balancing user experience with um, security. So anytime we can increase the security without impacting user experience, it's a great win for us. And overall, we're trying to control our applications and data. So I think now is probably a good time to switch gears and talking about secure enclaves. Once again, you don't have to build a secure enclave to be secure. There's lots of ways to do this. I just wanted to show sort of a trend happening, um, you know, that we're seeing out there. Um, for me, security tools have always been a big challenge. Like we've often seen general, general security tools that are used for the enterprise, you know, generally that are attempted to be deployed for virtualized environments without real deep considera consideration of its ramifications. You know, so I'd like to spend the rest of the presentation talking with Sean from Bitdefender about how they can address these challenges and, and how we can do better than just what I consider basic security. So we have three sections we're going to go over. The first one is security performance. Uh, so security performance can be detrimental to overall scalability. You know, the common root cause is trying to deploy traditional solutions in non-virtualized environments. They were not developed with virtualization in mind. They might work fine on a desktop or a laptop, but Aggregate, you know, when you aggregate the, the resource usage of memory and so forth, it just doesn't make perfect sense to just do what we used to do. You know, we have a lot of security agents out there watching the file system, very few actually doing anything about what's happening in memory. Um, you really need an engine to, you know, make these decisions based off threat intelligence. You know, we want to think about deploying full agents or not full agents or agentless. And then, you know, where is that gap between when the agent was installed and when it can catch up to the intelligence? You know, performance of security tools can be a big challenge for virtualized environments, but we believe this can be solved. Um, the tools can become aware, they can become optimized, they can be built for virtualized environments, and rather than just shoehorning them in, uh, let's actually do this the right way. 
So the first challenge I want to th uh, throw to Sean is the overall security performance. You know, performance of legacy AV, AV tends to have a lot of <coughs> overhead, right? It was fine for one VM, but then as I start running multiple VMs, uh, a couple hundred megs of RAM each, they each do their own updates, they might actually, you know, saturate the network doing that. Every single client would download those on it maybe and create a bottleneck on the network. Um, and many of these agents were meant for physical computers, but in a virtualized world, we're trying to get the most out of our hardware, and that overhead accumulates to really a true significant impact to sizing. So there's your challenge, Sean. Where, what do you have for me? Well, uh, the solution is actually pretty straightforward and pretty intuitive. So um, again, as, as you mentioned, having uh, a full agent duplicated on each and every virtualized endpoint doesn't make a lot of sense. If you figure, let's say, 200 megs of RAM consumed uh, each, maybe not a big deal in a virtualized server environment, but um, as the densities start to increase, especially looking at virtualized desktops, it's pretty simple to do the math. If we have 50 VDI instances, with 200 megs of RAM a pop just for the anti-malware, that's problematic. One of the basic tenets of virtualization, of course, is don't hang on to multiple copies of something when you can hang on to one and use it multiple times. So our version of doing that is centralizing the scanning engines, centralizing the threat intelligence at what we call a security virtual appliance. So this is one instance. It can be one instance per host. It can be shared across the hosts. Um, that's, that's an architectural decision. But the point is, by centralizing it, the Karen feeding, the um, performance impact, especially when we look at CPU and RAM, is centralized within a single system that can then protect multiple VMs. And so the end result is is a higher density of VMs per host. Now, you'll see the little Bitdefender logo within each VM. We do leave a small software artifact, a set of tools within each VM. Um, we have to do that to facilitate communication with the virtual appliance to have some file system drivers and some other stuff. But that's a fairly static piece. It doesn't actually have threat intelligence. It doesn't require uh, regular upgrades or updates. Um, now, what's important to note about that is there's a great term out there called agentless, which refers to the same thing, offloading most or as much of, uh, uh, as possible of the anti-malware intelligence and scanning to a virtual appliance. Agentless, it's a great term, but it depends on the perspective if it's truly agentless. Under the hoods, every solution that performs this style of scanning offload requires a set of tools within each VM. It may be embedded in tools that belong to the hypervisor vendor, um, but they're, they're still there. So um, really, uh, um, this intuitive approach comes down to instead of 200 megs of RAM footprint, for instance, uh, per VDI instance, have something more like 10 or 12 megs. Something very minimal, something very static that doesn't require a ton of care and feeding. Given this architecture of anti-malware, there are other things that we can do, other little tricks that help improve performance. So again, um, if we're centralizing and deduplicating the threat intelligence and the anti-malware scanning engines, we can also centralize and deduplicate scanning results. So we can have a centralized cache. Of course, in a local cache, no anti-malware is going to scan something more than once if that object hasn't changed. It doesn't make sense. But that cache can be shared at the virtual appliance level so that if a particular file is encountered on one instance, it's not scanned on any other instances that that virtual appliance sees. So if someone is sending around, let's say, a very large architecture document if the virtual appliance has already scanned it, already knows it's okay, it's not going to rescan it if it pops up on 50 other VDI instances. Also, those caches, of course, are pre-trained. We know what a good Windows or Linux operating system looks like. <laughs> uh, hands off the keyboard, Eric. So, 
Um, what we're doing is we're avoiding redundancy in here. Redundancy of scan results, redundancy of the footprint, and we're doing it all to reduce the impact on CPU, CPU, RAM, IO, network, especially during updates and upgrades. So overall, the results that we've measured using login VSI, you'll see up to 35% higher VM density. And of course, a really important statistic is faster application response time. This is what keeps end users happy when they click on something and what they expect to happen happens very quickly. Otherwise, they pick up the phone and complain. Of course, mileage will vary. I would encourage everyone to put this in their own environment, kick the tires on it, compare it to other solutions, compare it to whatever traditional solution you may be using now. I can't guarantee you're going to see these numbers, but you'll certainly notice a significant impact in a positive way. And so now we move on to optimizing management. Great. So great efforts have been made on performance, uh, latency, overhead reduction. Let's talk about management. So that's, that's been a pain on my side in the past, right? We often see pitfalls and tools where it comes to management if they're not virtualization aware. They often have these artifacts of uh, that are all, you know, replicating, you know, the same thing over and over. Um, lots of challenges with GUIDs, uh, you know, troubleshooting when your management console doesn't show you the right stuff is, is a real pain in the neck. You know, sometimes, you know, propagating these AV exclusions, is it real time or is there manual or do you have to use a secondary system just to do it? You know, very often local controls can be hidden from users, even administrators, so there's challenges with that. You know, we've often seen single points of failure created with these environments uh, and these solutions, you know. So the challenge I want to bring to you is, how has management been adapted to this world of virtualization uh, for Bitdefender? So it's all about integration. Um, now, first of all, I'll, I'll point out some nomenclature here. Our management solution is called Gravity Zone. Within Gravity Zone, the management piece is called Control Center. Although in, in this presentation, we're focusing on on-premises virtualization, Gravity Zone has a wider focus. So um, we still, of course, do anti-malware for physical endpoints. I, I venture the guess that almost everyone attending this webinar or listening to the recording is probably doing so from a physical system, a laptop, uh, most likely. So that's still an important part of the infrastructure. It needs to be managed from the same console. That right there is, is part of reducing the uh, management overhead, the management burden, have a single management uh, piece overlooking an environment. And as you pointed out in talking about the threat landscape, that landscape has gone beyond the data center and into other people's data centers or data centers managed by IaaS providers like AWS, Azure. So managing instances that run in those environments is very important. And of course, beyond endpoint security, we also do security for exchange and, and some other things. But getting back to the management headaches that are induced by security management that isn't integrated with virtualization management, it really comes down to a couple of significant areas. And they both have one thing in common, and that is automation. Virtualized environments are incredibly dynamic especially if we look at environments with a lot of non-persistent VDIs. Uh, there can be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 instances instantiated and destroyed within a day um, or many, many more. So a security tool that tries to keep up with that without automation is going to become itself a burden. So it's understanding what is occurring within that virtualized environment to one, automate deployment and the application of security, and two, automate uh, the provisioning of policies. Of course, having security installed is one thing, but having the right policy running at each endpoint is very important. So what we've done with Gravity Zone, it really comes down to, as I said, integration. Zen Server is an integration point. Nutanix Prism is an integration point. Uh, there may be folks uh, on this call who have deployed Nutanix or are considering it. Um, of course, we also integrate it with other areas, including 
cloud providers. It seems like a simple thing, but it makes a tremendous difference. So if we're thinking about, let's say, um, a bunch of uh, non-persistent VDI instances that are created from a golden image, uh, I'm going to use the simple uh, task-based end user call center classic example. When those systems appear or are created um, within the virtualization management system, the security system may see them, but it's going to see them with duplicate GUIDs. It's not going to understand that those systems are grouped separately. And it's essentially going to see a whole bunch of instances of the exact same uh, GUID from a security management perspective. That's extremely problematic for reporting, for the application of policy. It's also problematic because when that agent, which was buried into the golden image some time ago, wakes up, when it first boots on a clone, it then needs to start pulling down perhaps uh, uh, more recent versions of scan engines, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, upgrades. And it certainly will have to start pulling down updates. So this can lead to what is called a boot time security gap, a period of time from the initial uh, boot of that new instance to when it is actually being protected. So simply understanding that these systems belong in different groups and they are unique is extremely important. Now, if we think back to a conversation in the performance section where I mentioned the uh, piece that we leave behind within each instance, is a very small software artifact, a set of tools that is very static and all of the um, threat intelligence and scanning actually comes from the virtual appliance. That becomes very important in this case because that virtual appliance is always up and always running. So it always has the latest and greatest uh, uh, threat intelligence on it. So that boot time security gap does not exist in these cases. Indeed, as more systems are created, that's very important. Another problem that we see is actually a pretty simple one, and that's the cleanup of clones. If the security console isn't integrated with the uh, management system of the virtualized environment, as these systems are cloned, day one, day two, day three, these instances within the security console will start piling up. That can consume licenses um, if the licensing is done on a per instance basis, but generally it's a whole bunch of clutter and all of these systems are basically going to never go away or they have to be manually cleaned up. It's a simple thing, but by understanding what these systems are, by understanding that each clone is unique and understanding that they're not persistent so that when they are removed from that environment, they need to, that removal needs to be reflected within the security management is a, a, a very powerful thing. And also understanding that these systems exist within groups. Each of these call centers may have a different security profile based on different security needs. Indeed, within each of these call centers, Maybe there's a shift supervisor or some sort of elevated privilege user who requires within their own group uh, a different security profile. So that instant um, um, uh, replication of the inventory within the data center and the hierarchy within the data center in real time, that is absolutely key to being able to automate the application of policy. With that is also, of course, being able to do reporting properly on various groups and breaking it down according to the hierarchy. Uh, having different licensing models is important. If the licensing, as I mentioned, is being done on a per virtual server or per, per VDI instance um, count, then if non-persistent instances uh, are constantly being created and deleted on one side, but not in the security management side, then the licenses are going to get exhausted very quickly. Of course, a great alternative is to simply do licensing, licensing based on how many 
physical CPUs are underlying that environment. So especially for non-persistent workloads, having out-of-the-box support uh, of, of recognizing um, non-persistent systems, instantly protecting them, instantly applying the, the uh, correct policy based on inheritance is absolutely key and not having systems pile up in the, in the security management console every time they're instantiated and never removed is absolutely key. Seems like a simple thing, but it can be a real problem, uh, a significant problem in large environments. So that gets us into a really interesting area, which is instead of looking at endpoint security and saying, what are the problems that we need to solve? Uh, is there something about virtualization that can actually help us get better security than was possible before virtualizing. Over to you, Eric. Great. Yeah, so like you just said, everything before was solving problems with security that looked like your your, your parents' security, honestly. Uh, and with virtualization, we should be able to do more. Um, and, and I'd like to introduce at least hypervisor introspection. So the operating system of a physical computer talks directly to the hardware. With a hypervisor, the hardware is abstracted. And this really gives us a great opportunity to apply security at the hypervisor level rather you know, than within the VM. Um, you know, the hypervisor will have complete visibility into the guest VM, so it, it gives us a really nice opportunity. You know, so Citrix introduced support for direct inspect APIs within Zen Server, and this was after a long collaboration with many partners, you know, Zen Project, uh, Intel, Bitdefender contributed quite a bit actually. Um, and this allows vendors to create security and performance tools that watch the system from a different perspective. You know, they're capable of watching activities from outside the VM rather than inside the VM, which might be compromised. So this reduces the attack surface dramatically, as the first thing a hacker does once they get into the system is disable monitoring and disable the security tools. But if the security tools aren't on the system they're in, the, you know, the guest VM, um, it's really, really difficult for them to do it. And more than likely, they're gonna trip on the security uh, and, you know, not realizing that it was there. So back to you, Sean, let's talk about introspection. So uh, what we need to be clear about here is when we're talking about hypervisor introspection, we're talking about looking at uh, the memory of running VMs without touching those VMs. So in other words, without having a uh, software footprint in those VMs. And the implications of that are pretty significant. Um, so first off, under the hood, how does it work? Yes, it leverages some uh, Intel uh, extensions uh, that have to do with virtualization, and, and that's a product of work between Bitfender, Citrix, Zen Project, Intel, and so on. Um, Third-party tools are then granted access to protected uh, memory. Now, it sounds pretty simple, but uh, the, the devil's in the details. Um, but to be clear, this, this API, this capability is available to uh, other security vendors. It's just today Bitdefender is the only security vendor uh, who has a, a hypervisor introspection commercial product. So in the end, what we're doing is we're looking at memory. And a great example of what we will do with that capability is looking at an overflow, a buffer overflow. So simply put, let's say there's a function within an application. Um, it doesn't do bounds checking. It doesn't check how, how large the input uh, is of the variables to that function. You shove more input um, than it expects, and you can overwrite and exploit code outside of the bounds of uh, that function's chunk of memory, if you will. And I'm, I'm simplifying a lot of stuff here, but really buffer overflow is very descriptive about what it does. There's a lot of trial and error on behalf of attackers, but uh, fortunately for the attacker, they have all the chances in the world. Unfortunately for um, people who are trying to protect these systems, we have only one chance. So what we do with hypervisor introspection is we'll look at what should be happening with different parts of the memory. We'll, for instance, mark certain page tables, read, write. If we see that same buffer overflow come in, instantly we know someone is trying or something is trying to execute on a read, write page. 
that doesn't make sense. So we can take action based on um, what we see. We can log it or we can, of course, stop it. Now, buffer overflow is one example of an attack technique that attackers use over and over again. If you look through the vulnerabilities and, and related exploits, all the different CVEs out there, you'll see terms like heap spray, code injection, and of course, buffer overflow, and these other memory manipulation techniques over and over again. So with HVI, we're looking for these attack techniques. We're not looking for specific exploits. And we're certainly not looking for the payload that uh, can end up on a machine, the malware, if you will, that is the result of a successful attack. So that's a very important point and it makes HVI very powerful. And a great example that we have of that is Eternal Blue. So a group called the Shadow Brokers um, allegedly obtained Eternal Blue from the NSA. Um, it's apparently an NSA attack tool, um, comes in a nice Python wrapper to execute, but at the end of the day, Eternal Blue leveraged a buffer overflow to exploit a vulnerability in a very ubiquitous um, Microsoft component, SMB. Um, that ability to remotely execute code on a system without an end user having to interact at all was very powerful. It essentially gave the attacker complete control of that system without, uh, from afar without an end user having to click on something or, or do something silly. So a very serious vulnerability, um, very quickly on the heels of that attack kit being being publicly released by shadow brokers, uh, the developers of WannaCry or WannaCrypt, depending on where you're from, uh, incorporated that into their ransomware. And it was a very important part of the propagation of that ransomware. Other people used it for crypto jacking on and on and on. An important point here is that was post release of Eternal Blue. We don't know how old that exploit kit was. We don't know how long it was being used before it was publicly released. So that's a very interesting aspect and one to keep in mind. So HVI, because it is looking for those attack techniques like a buffer overflow, detected Eternal Blue before Eternal Blue was released. Simply put, Eternal Blue as a technique leverages buffer overflow. HVI is monitoring the memory of running VMs, looking for attack techniques like buffer overflow, it detected it. Nice and straightforward. So here's a quick recorded demo. Um, we've recorded this for time, but also because it helps us do things like this. We can, we can add some markup to the animation and make it much more clear. So first we're going to attack, in this case, an unprotected server, Win2K8 server, um, and install a, a simple Ring Zero backdoor. And this is using the, the publicly released Eternal Blue kit. So here in our, our inventory, which, which we've uh, got via our um, integration with Citrix, we pick a system. We're going to attack, in this case, uh, the 10.27 uh, system, which does not have HVI applied. HVI is running on the host that on the Zen server instance that both of these systems are on, but policy wise, we have it turned off for this particular uh, virtualized server. So we go through the configuration. Of course, we can see up there, it's running the uh, Python toolkit. It will fail the first couple of times. Most of these exploits have a, a couple of uh, different uh, iterations for different scenarios, but eventually we see it succeed and very quickly, it says, hey, great, um, I've installed the backdoor. You're ready to take control of that system. Now we'll execute it again. It's the exact same system. We've essentially cloned these systems, but one policy-wise has HVI turned on. Of course, different IP address, but um, in general, all the setup of uh, the kit is exactly the same. And then it gets configured and execute. 
we'll see it fail. We'll see it try a, a different uh, um, angle, see it fail again. And ultimately, once it has exhausted all of its attempts, it returns that it could not install the backdoor. It cannot exploit that system. So that's a very quick demo of hypervisor introspection in action. Uh, there's a lot of detail under the hood, but at the end of the day, the thing to remember is it has no footprint within the VMs and it is protecting those systems from attack techniques, not the specific exploits themselves, but the techniques that are used by attackers to exploit vulnerability. So here, as, as we wrap it up, we have boiled it down to the five things that, that can be achieved by Citrix and uh, Bitdefender in securing uh, digital workspaces and what you need to be concerned about. So Eric, I'll, I'll let you get started on that. I think just for sake of time, I'll just go through them real quickly. But really what we're trying to do is deliver better than physical security and better, better than physical everything, honestly. You know, we're trying to give the power back to IT by, you know, isolating and segregating applications and data and controlling the access, but at the same time, uh, making it so that the user impact is very low, uh, that they do not, you know, their work does not get impeded. And we're trying to drive performance at those virtualized endpoints. So we're trying to come up with ways in which we can increase the security while not decreasing the performance badly or, you know, having it really bad to manage. And overall, enhance the security and infrastructure of the management as well. And it's really key. There's a lot of great solutions out there that do some amazing security things, but at scale, they fail. So, uh, you know, I think that boils it down. I think just for sake of time, uh, we'll take a bit of time for Q&A. Uh, and then uh, any questions that we don't have a time to answer today, uh, we'll follow up an email uh, pretty immediately. So over to you, Donald. No, oh, thank you, Eric and uh, Sean, for giving us quite a bit of details on on how the Defender and Citrix sort of help uh, secure your the enterprise environment. Uh, several good, great, great questions um, came through during your presentation. Um, I think the first one is really popular, maybe around for everybody, is can Bitdefender protect against Spectre and Meltdown with HVI? And what what is the overhead of these security tools? Sure, so uh, I'll, I'll handle that. Um, so Spectre and Meltdown uh, are um, essentially problems within the underlying architecture of modern chips. It's, it's uh, not just Intel. Um, we all know who's out, out there and who has those problems. Um, because HVI is running at the hypervisor level, it's a couple of layers up. So the ultimately, the only solution to a problem in the underlying hardware lies in the underlying hardware. Um, so the quick answer is no. Hypervisor introspection, although it can it, it can protect everything from the hypervisor above in the stack, it cannot protect below the hypervisor in the stack where those vulnerabilities lie. Um, and the second oh, part, oh, sorry. I, I almost forgot about the second part, performance-wise. So, the, the way we look at this uh, at Bitdefender is on the one side, we have the scanning offload of anti-malware um, that imparts a tremendous performance advantage. HVI does have a performance cost. However, when we're looking at protecting, especially uh, the kernel within, um, uh, within protected VMs, and that includes anti-malware drivers, by the way, which is an interesting side point, um, the kernel protection has an extremely low uh, uh, performance impact. The protection of user mode services, is it comes down to how many applications one wishes to protect. If a whole bunch of applications are stacked, which tends not to occur uh, very often in uh, virtualized environments, the performance impact will increase. But um, even with a healthy number of applications, being protected on each VM, um, it's far outweighed by the performance advantages of the scanning offload solution. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, here's actually another related question regarding HVI. Um, in the event that an HVI event is tripped, what type of reporting is shown in Gravity Zone console as a result? 
Uh, yeah, I, I wish I had time to to get into the guts of that, um, and and that's an area that uh, we continue to to enhance and explore because uh, there are tremendous forensic possibilities there. Uh, we do show quite a bit of information. I think the the best way uh, is to either get your hands on the solution and kick it around in your environment, or check out some of the more in depth and HVI focus webinars that we've done, or even of course reach out to uh, reach out to me and I can set up a demo more than happy to show you what's in there today and what we have planned uh, for the future. Yeah, so it looks like HVI is still a theme of the questions. Um, another one came in just now. It's um, so since HVI ul utilizes API stack, um, when an event is triggered, does the tool allow you to inject another tool to analyze and perhaps resolve the situation along the built-in Defender solutions. Great question, and uh, I love questions where I can say absolutely yes. Uh, so we can inject cleanup tools, um, and that's part of how we're also looking at expanding on forensic uh, possibilities. But the quick answer is yes. It does give us the opportunity to inject cleanup tools um, to essentially uh, beyond just blocking um, the the memory activity that HVI detects. We can also do some other scanning. Of course, that's all policy-based and optional. Um, another question. Why can't HVI inspect exploitation attempts against the virtual CPUs? Uh, uh, so that would be a bit outside of, of my uh, knowledge, but uh, to take a stab at it, the vCPU is essentially a representation of instructions that are being exposed by the underlying hardware. So if there are faults in the underlying hardware, um, it, it can't be protected at HVI. It, it really comes down to uh, uh, where in the stack from hardware all the, way, all the way up to user mode land, HVI is operating. Awesome. Um, just, oh, ahead, just to call it out, yeah, just, um, Sometimes many of these attacks are multifaceted. Um, even if you use exploit A or exploit B, uh, you might escalate privileges using a different tool. Uh, you might install your rootkit or install your APT or call home service using a different tool. So, you know, we like security tools. We like having more than one at times. And just because something can't find a very specific attack, more than likely, or I shouldn't say that, uh, there is a chance that the hacker would trip uh, on a different stage of the attack. And we have other presentations around, um, you know, various uh, kill chain methods and RICE methods and stuff like that. So when we look at an attack, it's often, you know, five to ten stages, right? And if we can put the right tools into the right place to stop them at certain stages, that overall stops them, right? Or at least makes it very challenging or another door to get through. So there's a better way, you know, we have other presentations on this and I think we're developing some additional material on this, but, you know, we're trying to build walls that the, that the attacker has to jump through and hoops they have to jump through. And specifically with HVI, it's, it's, it's a really neat one. As I said in the last webinar, it's like, it's like this hidden sniper where, you know, the attacker doesn't see it. It's coming from a different place. And, um, you know, very often they would have to hack the hypervisor directly, which is on a management network rather than the VM that they're in um, to actually disable the tool. So, you know, it's about layering your protections and security and putting the right ones in place and understanding, you know, uh, risk versus reward trade-offs as to where to put your investments, honestly. Um, that's my answer. Uh, let's take one more question. Um, so, Eric, during your presentation and um, on designing and securing enclaves, uh, there was actually a question regarding TLS 4.4.4.3. Can you elaborate on the TLS version? Is it one, two, and the associated ports? So, yeah, yeah. So on the NetScale, we, technically, we only need 4.4.3 opened up. We're generally going to use TLS 1.2. Uh, I haven't read up on it in the last month or two. 1.3 is about to be ratified. I know there's, I don't want to say there's support or partial support right now. Um, but the idea is, is that, Actually, in some of our designs, what we've done is because we wanted to actually keep it very low impact, we just use the HTML5 browser, and then the user only connects uh, without receiver, but with the HTML5, and only touches 
and, and the only external port that's exposed is 443. Um, you know, if you look at our white paper, we have a CTX article on ports, strict ports, you know, and that one's very, you know, there's a lot of ports. But we're not, we're talking specifically when we say uh, we've limited the external to 443, that's just uh, for the user to get in. Uh, there's other ports in the back end that we want to also control, but it's about reducing that exposure. And very often there's other, like when we do federation, we do other stuff, there's other communication going outside of, of that edge at times. But I think in the user perspective, that's what we're referring to is 443 opened up, and that's the only thing that's opened up. And because it's hitting the Netscaler, and Netscaler has the ability to do that often in hardware, and it's a point in time at which we actually decrypt the traffic, um, it gives us the ability to inject stuff like network management analytics services and other sort of uh, capabilities around uh, analyzing that traffic. Uh, thank you, Eric, for clarifying that. Um, we do have a lot of great questions in the queue here, but uh, I'm going to just pass it over to Stephanie on how we can continue this dialogue. All right. Thanks, Donald. Uh, thank you, Sean. Thanks, Eric. Um, I know we did have more questions and we did run out of time a little bit. So I put in the chat window for you a link to a discussion thread on CUGC's website. You can ask questions there. It's also um, where we'll post the follow-up Q&A transcript after the webinar is done and where you can find a link to the recording. Um, speaking of the recording, you will get an email from GoToWebinar tomorrow. It will We'll have that link in there. It'll have the same forum thread link and um, a link to our survey if you don't fill it out now. Um, and so that survey link is in the chat window as well. But if you don't have time, you'll get it again tomorrow. And with that, just want to thank everyone for attending today and thank Bitdefender and Citrix. Um, great job. And uh, follow us on Twitter at MyCUGC and be sure to check out our site, mycugc.org. There's more webinars out there, um, discussion forums, local meetings, all that great stuff. So get out there and find your local group and get involved. Um, all right. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for being here today. I really appreciate your presentation. I think it was lots of info, and I know there's more to come because I know it's a big topic. Um, so thanks for that, and thank you so much, Donald, for staying on top of those questions for us. And with that, I will let everyone go. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day and um, see you on mycgc.org in the future. Bye, everyone.